All right, <clears throat> I am uh, especially excited uh, to introduce our closing keynote speaker uh, for this session, Dr. Michael Abramoff, who truly needs no introduction. Um, and so it's an honor for me to have the opportunity and the privilege to do this. Uh, Dr. Abramoff is the Robert C. Watsky, MD Professor in Retinal Research at the University of Iowa. He's a professor of ophthalmology and visual sciences, professor of electrical and computer engineering, and a professor of biomedical engineering. Uh, Dr. Abramoff is an internationally renowned physician, scientist, he's a fellowship trained uh, retina doctor, and for the last 20 years, he's been working on this problem uh, before it was so cool and before it was the hottest topic in all of science. He's been plodding along. Uh, he's been studying artificial intelligence and how it detects diseases. Uh, he has authored over 300 peer review publications, which have been cited over 22,000 times. He is an inventor who has been issued over 16 US patents. Uh, Dr. Abramoff's research has focused largely on the performance of smart cameras as well as the development of AI algorithms. Uh, Dr. Abramoff has been at this for a while. He's gotten a chance to work with some of the true pioneers in this field from Kunihiko Fukushima. You've heard of the neocognitron. Uh, Dr. Abramoff was doing a postdoc back there in Japan at the time in about 1989 and worked with the likes of Yan LeCun as it developed the backpropagation algorithm. So he's, he's been there. He was there at the beginning. And uh, uh, some of us are new to this and um, we're trying to catch on as fast as we can. Um, in addition to this, uh, his training, uh, Dr. Abramov has a master's degree in computer science, which focused on AI, and then he went on to do a PhD in image analysis, uh, both with uh, Jan Konderink and uh, Max Virgeber, who were his advisors you know, at the time. And um, believe it or not, Dr. Abramov is one of the original uh, developers of ImageJ. Um, he has lots of patents, uh, lots of work, and what's the most, what I find most fascinating about it is sort of the opportunity that he's having, and he's going to share that with us today, to shape the landscape of healthcare delivery from the business standpoint, from the medical legal standpoint, from the insurance standpoint. Uh, it's truly a privilege and an honor uh, to have you here, sir. Uh, without further ado, uh, let us uh, render a round of applause to Dr. Michael Abramoff, our closing keynote speaker. Thanks so much, Stephen. Always embarrassed when people say these things about me. So, <laughs> but thank, thanks very much. Uh, so we'll go over some materials that you already saw. It's, it's it's good now that everyone is showing the same slides when we talk about diabetic retinopathy. So you realize it's a big problem now. We can treat it if detect early. So I'm not going over that. One thing I want to point out is the most feared complication by people with diabetes. They fear it more than death and amputation. So that was impressive to me. And also about 24,000 people a year go blind as a result of diabetes in the US. And it's almost entirely preventable. And most of you know that. I just want to emphasize that. One thing that hasn't been emphasized as much is what I really care about is both the cost of healthcare, which is why I founded IDX, and also accessibility of healthcare. And there's a good example here. On the top right, you see the map of the US. And in blue, the density of ophthalmologists. So the more blue, the more ophthalmologists. You see it's about even, a little bit more on the coast. Iowa is, uh, of course, top down. And so, <laughs> and on the bottom right, where the people with diabetes are. The more red, the more people with diabetes. And you see in the southeast, there's lots of people with diabetes and not enough eye care relative to that. So access is a big problem. I mean, if you have close to a doctor and it's available, you can pay for it, it's all good. The problem is many people cannot. And so cost and access are the primary reasons to do, for me at least, uh, autonomous AI. And so here you see the system we developed in an answer to that problem. Um, and, and so it's more than an algorithm. We talked a lot about algorithms today, but if you want to fit it into the clinic and into healthcare delivery, it's really about being a system because you need an operator. And at the places where you do this, operators are not experienced ophthalmic photographers. They are people who run the telephone at the primary care clinic. So it needs to be high school graduation only. And we did it in our clinical trial. You need a robotic imaging system to allow people to take five retinal images per week to consistently get very, very high quality. You need operator-assistive AI that helps the operator, who again is not very experienced at all, 
to, to tell them when the image is out of focus and we take it, or when it's the wrong area of the retina and we take it. And then finally, there's also the AI itself, which you know is the most exciting, right? Um, but it needs to be integrated in the EHR and in the clinic workflow. About that. Those are big challenges. But anyway, so we did that. We integrated it in the EHR, and you know, very proud still that last year in April we got FDA clearance for the first ever autonomous AI. And what that means is that you can make a point of care diagnosis in minutes without any physician involvement. No physician reads those images ever. It's the computer who does it. It means you have a specialist quality. It's better than me as a retina specialist, I like to say. In primary care, anywhere where you have primary care, this can be installed. It's aligned with the American Academy of Ophthalmology guidelines for diabetic retinopathy and improves access. So on the right, you see an NPR uh, piece that was done on us uh, a few months ago. And, and you know we are in about 20 places around the country, but the one I'm probably most proud of is New Orleans where downtown New Orleans, after Katrina, there was very little eye care left, and people with diabetes needed to wait almost a year to get the diabetic eye exam. So they never went, and then they go blind, as we know. And so now with the AI there, it's, it's, a, it's a day. And, and Deborah, uh, who is the, the primary sort of, you know, she, she, she has been very involved in this, and we take her all Making a medical diagnosis used to be a doctor's sure, responsibility, yeah. but now you might be diagnosed in a different way with artificial intelligence. So that's from that NPR piece, but you can find it online. Just look for NPR, AI, and, uh, and uh, FDA. My name is Deborah Brown, and I'm a nurse practitioner at UMC in New Orleans. I'm in the Diabetes Endocrine Clinic. I am actually doing retinal eye screenings as well as diabetes uh, clinic and primary care clinics as well. Patients who require the annual uh, retinal screen who are diabetics, uh, we're not getting those screenings done on an annual basis. Uh, and according to our HEDIS report, it was only 10% compliant. Realized that the ophthalmology staff could not uh, accommodate the number of patients that were required to come through their program. To this, uh, we started using the IDX machine, and so uh, we were, before reading the uh, film and referring to patients who had more than uh, moderate retinopathy, but with the machine, it actually gave us the results. And we feel a little bit more confident about what we are seeing because the machine actually spits out the results within 60, 60 seconds after we take them. So, and again, you know, you see Deborah there sitting in the White House and she was in Congress. And, and so she's such a good advocate for AI technology. and. Uh, and the people she works with are really, you know, desk staff, and, and she trains them up, and it's, it's just wonderful. So again, how you implement this in the workflow is, is illustrating, right? So on the top you see, normally you have a diabetes visit, and you go to the doctor to take your vitals, they should do a blood draw, uh, and then you get to the provider, and they talk to you about uh, losing weight, and eating more veggies, and stop smoking, you know, all the usual that we do. And then they send you out for the diabetic eye exam, and that, you know, like others said, happens in about 15% of cases, so 85% don't get it. And then telemedicine in the middle, you know, is a solution, and, and, and you talked a lot about it. One of the problems with that is that, you know, you take the images in the clinic, so that's good, at least you have the images, but then still someone else needs to look at these, and it can take days, and then if the images are not good quality, which happens in about 20 to 30%, you need to call them back, and they don't come, and so it's still not a perfect solution. And so what is nice about the autonomous AI is the bottom row where, again, you know, you get the patient, the vitals, and then they go to the IDXDR, and then within minutes you have a diagnosis. And only then do they say to the provider, and you can already tell them, well, your diabetic retinopathy is good or bad. So that's the difference in the workflow, and that is starting to improve access now, which is really a big problem. And so, you know, I, I saw you talk about the road less traveled, and I, I like that so much. Uh, I, I happen to have the same slide, and I wanted to keep it in, but, you know, you were first. And, and so, you know, we, we, we could do two things a few years ago. We could work within the healthcare system or we could go around it. And you see, for example, Uber, you know, they went around the system, they break the system. And we decided not to do that. And that's why we get to, you know, went through eight years of working with FDA to get this clearance. It was a tough road. Uh, but, you know, there's this tremendous potential. And now I'm starting to talk about healthcare delivery. You know, consider the AI for diabetic retinopathy at least solved. We can do it now. And others will do it. And other companies are doing it, which is good. But again, it lowers cost, 
it value, you know, it's high quality, better than me in this case. It increases access. But autonomous AI is interesting because, again, it makes a diagnosis by itself. And it also means, like you said, you need, uh, as a company, to have liability insurance, medical malpractice insurance. We are liable for a misdiagnosis, just like a doctor is. But there's also many concerns, and I wanted to stress that because, you know, it's become more important. People are worried. The public is worried. Physicians are worried. Is it safe? Is there racial and ethnic bias? I mean, how can we exclude that? Does it actually benefit patients? I mean, it's really cool to talk about technology, but are the outcomes for our patients better? Or will doctors lose their jobs? And I will show you a slide about that. Are we using patient data appropriately? Are we not abusing people's patient data that they gave to US doctors and, and trust, and now you know making money out of it? Is that appropriate? So I talk a lot about that. There's a Washington Post panel on, on racial bias in AI a, a few months ago. And just as an example, so you need to address that. Uh, but you know, about the doctor's fear, my nickname is the Retinator. So, <laughs> yeah, you laugh now, okay? But I was an assistant professor taking, trying to make tenure, and the chair of ophthalmology at Hopkins comes out and writes this editorial about me because I was doing AI in, uh, long ago. And he says, the Retinator, revenge of the machines. Whoa, you know? And, and so, <laughs> was not easy to explain. And, and so, you know, the, the fear of job loss is there, but I think, you know, with, with the American Academy of Ophthalmology, and you know, ophthalmologists in general are now very comfortable with AI because they see what it actually can do and what it means. But, you know, in the general public, that fear is there, and in the physician community in general, that fear will always be there. So we need to be transparent and accountable for how we talk about it and what it actually does. And so it's so important to be very transparent about the safety, efficacy, and equity. And I name these the principles of safety, efficacy, and equity. I'll explain a little bit what it is because uh, you know, they're important in the design of AI and the validation of AI. And they're now part of the American Medical Association's uh, uh, policy on AI. So they, they, they're part of that. And that's very exciting. And so for example, if you design AI, how do you take into account racial bias? Well. As you know, you know, if you're an ophthalmologist, you know that the retinal color differs in different races and ethnicities greatly. Um, and so if you train your algorithm just based on data, just based on images, you better be absolutely sure that all races, ethnicities, and other groups are represented. How can you be sure about it? That's really, really hard, especially with the limited data that we have available in the medical field. There's always an ethical problem and a danger to the patient to get the data. And the funny thing is, for for hundreds of years, ophthalmologists have been looking at these retinas, diagnosing diabetic retinopathy, not on the basis of the entire image, but looking for lesions, for biomarkers, for hemorrhages, and exudates, and you already mentioned it, and you did too. But these are racially invariant. I mean, a hemorrhage is a hemorrhage. And so, rather than build systems around images and trying to have the AI discover in a black box fashion what it is detecting, we actually build detectors in the middle row for each of these different lesions and so each of the detectors looks at a small area of the image, and then the combined outputs of the detectors lead to the diagnosis. And it's interesting that, you know, A, you remove the racial and, and ethnic bias in the design phase, and it also turns out that these systems are more robust. And we, you know, my group studied years ago, but now Harvard has, been, been, has done a big study on the robustness of this type of algorithm. So that's exciting, too, that we made the right choice, and, and sort of the clinician's choice, right? And so another aspect is how do you validate AI? And we'll get to the racial and ethnic bias, but just in general, you know, what patients care about is not whether their doctors agree. They don't care. They want a good outcome. And so it's really important that you evaluate these AIs in terms of patient outcome. With chronic diseases, that's really hard because it may take 20 years for the outcome to become visible. But that's why we have so-called patient outcome proxies. And the EDTRS, which has been around for 40 years and is still used for these new drugs that you talked about to validate these, all the drug studies are done with this specific standard, which is cool. Because what happens if you have a, a retina or an image of the retina, you can directly associate a number with that, called an EDTRS number. And that gives you the patient risk of developing blindness and other complications. So we can actually say, with this image or with this uh, you know, state of the retina, this is going to be the outcome. That's why it's a patient outcome proxy, even though it's a chronic disease. Because if you, again, if you look at, at doctors, they vary, but they do not vary in systematic ways. You probably are educated in some program, you did your fellowship in another program, and typically doctors from the same program think alike and diagnose hemorrhages alike. And for example, on the bottom right, you see 
the actual patient outcome proxy. These are all hemorrhages, all three. You see those, those red spots maybe in the middle, at least on the left one. And that's a hemorrhage, and 80% of ophthalmologists, if you ask them, agree that's a hemorrhage. On the right, it's pretty subtle, but it's still a hemorrhage according to the standard, the outcome standard, but only 20% of ophthalmologists agree. So you can see how that introduces variability if you look at doctors that you simply don't have if you look at patient outcome. And that's why you're actually able to say, you know, this is better or worse than, a do than, a, than an ophthalmologist. And then, by, by the way, the modern standards are not enough to just take retinal photos anymore. You also need to include OCT because that's how we treat diabetic macroedema, which is actually more common than the, the ischemic form of diabetic retinopathy in patients. So we did the clinical trial. And then, you know, another aspect of this, this racial and ethnic bias in your AI is that you also validate it against that. So your, your, your sample of, the, of people with diabetes need to be representative of all people with, with, with diabetes in the U.S. There's 30 million of them, and about 25% are, you know, 20% are African American. So you have to make sure that those are in that study. Same for Hispanics, same for women and men. So you need to make sure that in your validation for the FDA, just like with a drug study, uh, you validate it for all, uh, uh, you know, you, you look at the different biases. And then this, this is what you get, and I don't think you can read it in the back, but here you see what the endpoints were for the FDA study. Three endpoints, sensitivity, which is safety, specificity, which is efficacy, and, uh, uh, and diagnosability, which measures equity. And so you can see that the AI met all three endpoints, and on the blue column on the right, you see the numbers for ophthalmologist compared to that exact same patient outcome standard. And two of the three endpoints cannot be met by you and me as ophthalmologists. And it shows you that that is a very tough standard to meet. You need to meet all three. And then you can also look at reproducibility. If you're a doctor and see, you see a patient and you see the same patient a week later, you will probably vary 20 to 30 percent. And it's just hard. And so you see that in the numbers, but the AI is very robust, 99.6 percent. It will give you the same diagnosis one week after another, even with another operator. So you have this sort of consistency, this sort of robustness that we humans just, you know, are not good at. And that's fine, because we do other things better than AI, but this specific thing, the AI does really well. And sorry, and, and by the way, then we also tested it to make sure that these three endpoints, safety, efficacy, and equity, were uh, equally uh, good for all races and ethnicities, uh, sex, and, and uh, ages. So that's how you create AI that is safe, efficient, uh, and equitable. And these are now endpoints for other AI studies. What is nice about what we did with FDA is that we created a pathway for other autonomous AI for companies to follow. So now you know you need to do these things. There's a short list. It's much longer in reality about you know, big things that you need to meet before you can get uh, through FDA. And like I said, one is this medical liability coverage, which is an automatic consequence of saying you're autonomous now. And so what is exciting is that the AMA, the American Medical Association, and I would love to talk to the NMA uh, about this, how they see this, but you know, what are the principles uh, of, of AI? And you, you can look at online now, and you can see their safety, efficacy, and equity, which is kind of cool because we worked it out with the FDA. But you can also see that autonomous AI systems should accept liability for the, for the output, which means you know, medical malpractice insurance in effect, right? And so uh, I, I think we already talked about it. It's, it's, it's interesting that you start with, with coding and algorithms and, you know, C++ coding, and I love coding, and I love seeing patients. But then as you, as you go on, you learn about clinical trials and how to develop that because no one had ever done it, and how to deal with this bias issue because we, we started thinking about it 10 years ago. Uh, and then you get clearance, and then how do you actually implement this into practice, and how do you get paid for it? And now. I'm supposedly an expert on AI payments. And, and so that was a lot of work because literally everything in healthcare is built around physicians, humans doing stuff and, and, and diagnosis and treatments. And so uh, when we came in in April 2018 with this uh, AI, well, how are we going, even going to pay for this? I mean, there's no RVUs for the AI. There's no you know, uh, relative uh, value units. So there was a temporary code, and this already shows you, right? I was the retinator, and now the American Academy of Ophthalmology and the AMA are helping us to establish a temporary code for AI that people like in New Orleans and many other places in the US are now using to bill and collect, which is you know, cool. It's temporary, but at least we have a sort of bridge. And now for, for, for years we have been working 
on creating an actual uh, CPT code for AI that is really for autonomous AI. And you can understand how novel that is because the entire CPT system, you've probably heard about it, CPT codes, you know, how, that's how you bill. If you're not a doctor, that's how you bill. You, you know, everything needs a CPT code. If you don't have a CPT code, you will never get paid, forget it. And so you need a CPT code, but there's no RVUs. Normally a CPT code says, well, there's so much doctor work involved and you have some equipment. But for the AI, that isn't, there's no, so we created AI work and the concept of AI work and I'm very proud to say that the editorial, CPT editorial meeting in May 2019, you know, this code was, 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 well, there's a very complicated process that's very secret. So I cannot talk about it too much, but you can see here on the bottom, you know, there's an automated point of care retinal imaging, which, which is a very cryptic way for the CPT to say, yeah, there's now 92.5x. They, they're probably going to give it a number in September or October, the actual number that you can use to bill. And you know, we will be able to, everyone will be able to bill under it in January 1, 2021. So that's when it uh, goes into effect. But it's, um, did I skip something in the slide? So there is you know, a temporary code until the permanent code uh, can be used uh, for the first time ever for autonomous AI. And again, the way this worked is that we tied the having a code and payment to rigorous validation and rigorous design. So if you meet all these criteria of safety, efficacy, and equity, and all these, you know, both in design and validation, then there is a pathway to a code. And, and that's really important for many other companies that are developing AI, both for diabetic retinopathy, for other diseases in the retina, and also for other diseases in the skin and the cervix and everywhere else where you can use AI, because now, you know, it can be done. Just like with the FDA, we showed it can be done if you do it right. And now for the payment, it can be done if you do it right. And I think that's very exciting. And meanwhile, uh, so this is a little bit more, maybe too much wonky background, because I'm so proud of it, about how we uh, developed this, this, uh, this new code and how the discussions are ongoing. And so I don't want to, uh, because one minute, right? So. Um, so, you know, relevance for clinicians, you, you hear all this stuff about AI, you know, you know, waving over you, Auto artificial intelligence is killing it in healthcare. I do not make this up, this is an actual headline. <laughs> and, you know, how can you say that, right? You know, killing. I mean, and, and will AI make physicians obsolete? I mean, so these are scary headlines and, you know, I'm, 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 am I able to keep up and what do I do with all of this? And so AI versus MD, you see that cover there? I mean, you know, it keeps coming, right? And so you get worried and, you know, am I missing the boat here? And I think, you know, the important thing to realize is uh, it's technology. Um, it can be helpful and it can be harmful. We need to make the right choices. So as a clinician, you will be asked to evaluate systems, you know, by your healthcare system. They may come to you and say, well, what do you think of this AI? Should we be using it or not? They share what your expertise is. And so, you know, look at validation, look at the clinical trial, just like with a new drug. You will not use the drug until you understand whether it's appropriate to use it on patients. I mean, it is FDA approved, but this is actually the right drug for my patient here. And so it's the same with AI. Does I, do I, with my expertise as a doctor, do I understand what the trial was? You know, what about bias? What about these principles of safety, efficacy, and equity? And so that's, that's relevant, um, you know, how to interpret the claims that are made versus the hype, because there's a lot of hype out there, I already showed it, and there's much more. Understand the clinical studies, evaluate the scientific evidence. That's going to be crucial for us physicians. What is less relevant in my view, in, you know, can you recite the technical details of the AI algorithm? You show, you know, I, I didn't show you any layers or neurons. I can talk about it forever, I love that stuff, but I think it's, it's less important right now because AI, as an algorithm is almost a commodity. Everyone can pull it off the net, and you just take data and you train it, right? But now it needs to be safe, efficient, uh, equitable. How do you prove all of that? How do you get it through a clinical trial? How do you implement it in clinical practice? Those are the big things we're running into now. And, and so, for example, how do you bring this, this AI into non-medical areas, like, you know, Minute Clinics, here is Walgreens, we're actively discussing with AMA how we create a medical home and expand it. And that's turning very important in terms of healthcare delivery. So there's a lot of excitement and a lot of opportunity for physicians to inform themselves and be informed without you know, being paralyzed by, oh my God, there goes my job. That's, you know, I'm the retinator. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's not how it works. And so there were two movies, right? You know, well, there were many more movies, but there's two. Remember, there's two, okay? Not one. And so re 
And, and so, you know, we are very excited because we're do doing one for glaucoma. It's interesting, I say glaucoma in quotes, because actually right now the big hurdle for AI for glaucoma screening is that the clinicians cannot agree, the experts cannot agree what glaucoma actually is. So how do you evaluate an AI when you don't know what to run it against? Because the FDA, you know, doesn't like taking decisions, right? They want to depend on, on scientific evidence and, and, and key opinion leaders to tell them what to do. And so they worry that if they say, well, this AI works, some clinicians will say, well, we won't agree that this is actually glaucoma, what you're detecting there. And so they, they you know, we're working very hard with the FDA to create a consensus. At least like um, someone said it, macular degeneration, we have ARIDS, which is also an outcome proxy. And so there we're going into clinical trial probably end of this year for another autonomous AI. We have a very cool one, which is acute middle ear infection for children, uh, where it's actually a therapeutic AI, I mean, it does a prescription. And we're working very hard with the FDA to bring that into clinical trial. And there's many other groups, cervical cancer, skin cancer, I already mentioned it. So there's a lot of very bright future for autonomous AI. Uh, and again, you know, embrace it and, and do not fear it. Thank you so much. Brooklyn, New York. Um, Dr. Abramov, thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedule to share your knowledge with us. Um, as the map showed, we don't have enough manpower, so even if we are better at diagnosing disease and figuring out who needs to be helped, who's going to actually help them? Yeah, so great question. So what I can do is, is build AIs, and what, what is nice is it shifts the burden, right? So rather than diagnosing all these people who don't have retinopathy, we have more time to treat people who have retinopathy because you're essentially, rather than getting 100% of your patients only 10 to 20% having the retinopathy, most of them will now have retinopathy if they get referred by the AI. So you can focus your efforts on that and you know, do even more injections, to be honest. Yeah. And as you said, as chair of the ophthalmology section, I hope you do partner with us and we can help you. Yeah, 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 so I would love to connect, absolutely, yeah. I really do appreciate your comments about the biomarkers right. being more sensitive and racial differences right. in terms of the disease process. And are you working with uh, any groups in the Caribbean or Africa at all as well to increase the numbers of uh, black funders? No, no, I, I would, uh, well, I would love to do that. Uh, no, I, I just came from Japan, so we're very active there. Uh, we have some other places. So we're. We, we started in the, in the US because we thought the FDA was the highest hurdle, so we want to start here and then roll it out to other places, but I would love to, to talk more about it. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I, I was invited to a conference in the Dominican Republic, so I expect to be discussing implementation there, but I would love to, to talk more. And how do you see this um, in resource poor areas like uh, in the Caribbean and Africa, for example, how do you see the AI being successful in resource poor areas? Well, so, so my principle has been um, that we first need to make it safe and do, do not harm the patients. And so we have proven that now. And so now, you know, we're creating business here that's going well, but we need a little bit more. And then we expand to places like Japan, Australia, Canada. And only then do you start to roll it out where, you know, there's just less resources available. They cannot pay for it. So you need to make it in a super philanthropic way, or we need very reduced cost. I mean, it's almost infinitely scalable. It's more how do you connect it to the healthcare system and all these things that you need to do well, right? And so um, we started to do that. There's a, strong, a company called Retina Global. We're working with at least right in India. But absolutely, you know, there's only 60 people in IDX, so we're trying to first wrap it up in the US and then and rolling it out worldwide. Okay. Hi, thank you for your talk, Dr. Ibernau. Um, I'm a University of Iowa graduate from the medical school, so... Ah. <laughs> <laughs> got, got two questions for you. Um, first of all, how, um, how long, um, as far as the FDA approval, how long did that take and how long have you been working on it? And how did you manage to, uh, are you part of a company, but how did you manage to integrate that into your professorship as well? Yeah, so, uh, that's a hard question. So the first, um, I literally worked with uh, uh, Fukushima when he did the Nihako Control in Japan, which was cool, but I really started working on this 20 years ago, I was a resident, 20 years ago. 
I saw it was a long route, and then I started working with FDA in 2010, so nine years ago. It took a long route to, when I came and said, you okay? Um, when I came to them and said, uh, hey, I want to do this autonomous AI, they said, whoa, you know, that the bluffs. So it took a while for them to get, and, and us to get used to each other, and, and but now it's very close, as you can see from these other trials we're trying to do. And so it took long. I was actually briefing the Federal Trade Commission on this issue because they said, well, is it going to take another eight years for the next AI? And they said, no, because we created this entire pathway. People know what to do now. The FDA knows how to do it and how to look at it. And you're seeing, A, many companies we are helping uh, to go through, and B, you're seeing more companies doing the trials. So I, I think that's, that's, that's you know, not as bad as we had it. And the other question, yeah, I still see patients one day a week. I'm the CEO of this company. I'm, traveling all the time, it's getting harder and harder. It's still doable. I don't have R1s anymore, I don't have graduate students anymore, but that became impossible. It's hard. Great, I'm working on a healthcare app as we speak now. Oh well, there you go. Well, you know, yeah, but count on it to be seeing less patients as, as you become more successful. Hi, Dr. Rolf, uh, great presentation, thank you so much. And uh, it's an honor to actually be in the same room with you. I talked about you during the Health Tech Austin last year, when you know, I did get the FDA approval, so that was phenomenal. My uh, question surrounds, you know, how can we get a, a bigger bank for our book? I mean, um, your IDX focuses on you know, diabetic retinopathy, which is great, but my question is more of, generic eye detection. Um, so last year I spent the entire year looking at uh, ways of detecting eye problems and I was part of NSF's uh, innovation co program and I talked to parents, teachers, ophthalmologists, everybody. And the very sad news is that when it comes to schools, over 60% of parents think the school is doing a great job of looking after the eyes of their kids. And I actually took the eye test in the public school, and this is how it went. Two minutes, look at the eye chart, boom, 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 out. Right? And so a lot of kids go undiagnosed, and this, you know, severely impacts their learning. So do you have any thoughts? I mean, right in this room, we have the experts in computer vision, AI, and everything else, but how can we you know, bring about a more systematic way of screening eyes so that you know, we, we can make sure that our young and you know, our, our next generation are having a good time and learning, right? Rather than waiting towards the end when they're working around, 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 you know, many different doctors and many, many bad things that happen. Yeah, so I cannot answer totally, but let me, let me reframe it a bit. So, you saw what happened to gene therapy. So, gene therapy was tried 20 years ago. And people died because they, they didn't prepare it well enough. They were trying to hide the risk and it was shut down. And the first gene therapy approved by FDA only came out two years ago. It was 20 years later than it could have been. And so you see the same with self-driving cars. That's why I'm pulling up this slide. You know, it was a, a lethal accident with an Uber autonomous car in, in Phoenix. And Toyota and many other companies shut out for a while because you get this backlash, this overreaction if you don't do it right. And so my, my, my concern is doing it right. And that's, I'm very zealous on the safety, do no harm issue. Because if we start doing curtain corners, I, I'm worried it will be shut down and we lose all the advantages for 20 years again. And so I, I, I think initially we really need to hammer on safety, which means every diagnosis, you need a, a clinical trial, which is, you know, takes millions of dollars, if not tens of millions of dollars. And, and so but if, you, if you play it wrong now, I think, we are very vulnerable, it will be shut down, like you saw in these other gene therapy. And so, eventually, people will be more relaxed on it. There will not be as much pushback, and the fact that some uh, AI may have misdiagnosis will not be in all the newspapers and all the, uh, the FDA will be shut down, for example. So, we need to get used to it, and then you can start working, you know, easier to the and making it even more widely available. Because I agree, you need, that's where it, need, it needs to go. But, you know, I think it's, it's more incremental and step by step. We cannot do everything at once because then for sure it will shut down. And by day is, you know, the public, right? Thank you very much. Two more questions. Excellent talk, Dr. Kamal. I'm, um, I'm overly impressed with how you've gotten to where you are right now. I, I, when I started out as a, in bioengineering, I, 
we had, I had a colleague back in the 80s who was looking at specifically eye images and how it was ultimately getting to where you are now. And I, and, and having gone through an experience of trying to do this in telemedicine in the early 90s, it takes an incredible amount of patience and focus and, and, uh, and persistence to get to, I realize where you've gotten now. And I, I, have, I just applaud you because I think you, you sort of laid a roadmap for how AI will actually get into clinical practice. My question is, and where I am now in public health, I'm looking to see how do we best integrate technology into public health. I believe you're at, at the point, and especially having gone through the FDA, and now you have some starting in the U.S. and then going international, because if you go international and try to come to the U.S., I tried that too. That doesn't work as much. So I'm, I'm, uh, what I'm going to, what I would like to ask is have you, has anybody from the public health arena like the CDC approached you? Because I know this is a big, big issue at the CDC right now. How do we screen for diabetic retinopathy? How do we get people into the uh, diabetic uh, EPP program, diabetic prevention program, and I actually have a grant that's looking at how to best do that. So this is, I, I would, uh, well I guess I'm asking you, you told me, you said you just shut your head down, but I think that that is a, a wide area for you right now, especially with this technology. So I'd like to talk to you about this. Yeah, yeah. I'll give you a card and then. Thank you. Thank you. Last question. Dr. Anika Goodwin, Greensboro, North Carolina. Thank you, Dr. Ekanaka. Enjoyed it as always. Thank you for being such a trailblazer. The question I have is for Welsh Allen's retina view and these large networks that are already out there, are you marketing the technology to them so that they can start to bring it into their, their current clients, or are you marketing directly to primary care offices? How are you doing that? We're going to primary care offices, and I'll explain you why. Um, telemedicine is not you know, it doesn't need to go to FDA. And, and so these standards are impossible to meet if you're telling us at these endpoints. And so one of the problems is that you need to have very high quality images in primary care. And that's why we tested out all the cameras that are out there, more than 25 of them. Maybe you've seen me talk about it. And, and so there was one, the top one, in the 400, which is this robotic camera. Really tedious to use. And we still needed an AI around it. An assistive AI that helps the operator take a look at the images. So it, it, it is not, hey, let's take this camera and let's take this AI, immerse them, and we'll work it out. It needs to be embedded in the workflow, and that's why I said it's a system, not an algorithm. So I wish we could, but right now, the, you know, the, the portable cameras get us 50% diagnosability, meaning a valid diagnostic result. We need to meet an endpoint of 82 and a half, and we've met 96%, meaning 96% of people with all ages of diabetes can get a valid diagnostic result, and that's just impossible with an iPhone camera or a portable camera or whatever. So I, I can do it. I mean, I can diagnose you with an iPhone camera, but, but you know, not a so high school graduate with one hour of training. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to all our excellent speakers, and thank you to everyone in the audience. Um, this has been really enjoyable for me, and uh, I would like to thank you again. <laughs>